Euromax highlights. And here's your host, Louise Houghton. Hello and welcome to another packed show. Let's begin with a look at what's coming up in the programme today. Rip Roaring Ride, sailing one of the fastest regattas in the world. Motion Pictures, investigating the art of camera tossing. And Cold Cuts, a Berlin designer sinks her teeth into meaty accessories. We start off in London, a city which has already hosted a number of successful events this year. This week, though, the 10th London Design Festival saw the who's who in the world of design flock to the British capital. The event included a range of exciting and ambitious projects. We headed to a few of the attractions in the Big Smoke to see what's new on the scene. 200 exhibitions and events in just 10 days. London is packed with design events and 350,000 people are expected to attend. Designer Tom Dixon will be showing his new collection at his shop at the Grand Union Canal. Dixon's studio is fairly large with a staff of 65. Dixon was head designer at large furniture companies like Artec of Finland. He started his own label in 2002 and now sells his products in 63 countries. His big theme this year is light. For any designer, it's really exciting when technology is changing and moving because that allows you to do new things. So in lighting at the moment, there's a, a huge amount of change, particularly in LED technology. And it's a field which is actually quite confusing, you know, and confusion is quite good for design in a way. The conventional light bulb is being replaced by light-emitting diodes, or LEDs. It's the light of the future, since Europe and the US have effectively banned incandescent bulbs. And that means big changes for light design. This year we're talking a lot about uh, more the effects that light makes rather than um, just the shape of the shade. So these shades have been um, created specifically to cast shadows and to break up um, uh, what can be quite a harsh light from a, a bulb. The Victoria and Albert Museum, which is the center of the design festival, is also showing innovative light design. Artist Dominic Harris has turned the tunnel entrance to the museum into an interactive installation. The work's title is Walk the Light. Walk the Light is comprised of two primary lighting elements. The first is this physical band of white light that follows you in the space. But the second part is this ambient color wash that we are seeing. The system recognizes people in the tunnel by their body temperature and follows them with a spotlight on a track. The colors of the light change depending on how many people are entering or leaving the museum. In Dominic Harris's installation, light is used to draw visitors' attention to their surroundings. I don't see a joy in the future of kind of like Blade Runner-like environments where uh, building facades become just giant signage and advertising panels. So what I'm always looking for in these large lighting installations is to give some kind of relevance that is uh, relevance to the environment, relevance to the people, the users. Another work by Harris is a cross between art and design. He likes experimenting with light and how it interacts with things. Harris also owns his own studio with a staff of 16. But this is his first time at the London Design Festival. This idea of experimentation with the public, uh, this I couldn't ask for a better space, so I'm delighted to be here. Not far from the museum, at the Conran shop, several star designers are exhibiting red objects. The pieces were commissioned by designer Terence Conran's furniture chain. And they're all up for sale. The Spun Chair by Thomas Heatherwick. Tables by the Bogolek Brothers. New lamps by celebrated up-and-coming British designer Benjamin Hubert. And a lamp by German designer Ingo Maurer. It's one of a kind. At almost 31,000 euros, it's one of the most expensive items at the festival. Many festival visitors are inspired by what they see. I like the whole industrial design kind of vibe of the um, London Design Festival. I've been a couple of times before, but I think it's getting more uh, energy now. I think um, it's getting more momentum. It's got more edge than a lot of other shows in Europe. Before I moved to London, I considered that London was, has a very special location worldwide about design. 
and because the special inventiveness of the British designers. Designer Tom Dixon is known for versatility. He's taken part in the festival since the beginning. In 2009, he moved to his current quarters where he organizes his own parallel events. It's a very confusing festival because it, it tries to incorporate hundreds of different types of design under one umbrella. So there'd be graphic design and software design, installation, architecture, but it, it is unique as a, as a festival with such breadth in the world. 10 years of the London Design Festival. The event gives British designers international attention and the sales don't hurt either. Now, a major regatta is underway in the North Atlantic, the Mod 70 European Tour Sailing Championships. For five weeks, trimorans, which are basically catamarans with three hulls, will be tearing up the waters over 5,000 miles. They set sail on the 2nd of September from Kiel in Germany and are making their way around the west coast of Europe to Genoa, Italy, stopping at Cascais, Portugal, along the way. It was there that we caught up with the international crew of Omen Sail to get a first-hand experience of life on board. Five identical trimorans are sailing at speeds of up to 37 knots, or 70 kilometers an hour, off the coast of Portugal. We go full speed, we go full speed. In moments like these, Sidney Gavinier, the French skipper of the Oman, is in his element. I really enjoy feeling the wind, feeling the waves, feeling what is going to happen. So yes, you have to be very well connected with the elements for sure. But, but I'm not, what I enjoy is not being at sea just to be at sea. You know, cruising is not my uh, cup of tea. What I like the most is the adrenaline. And those boats are also, you know, when there's a bit more wind, providing lots of stress because we go very fast and it's like a Formula One. And I think that's what I need for my uh, body. Once back in the harbor of Kashkaish, the high performance sailboats look quite tame once again. All five boats have the same slick, clean lines. They look a little bit like birds with those, uh, with those uh, beams. Um, we kind of, we say that we fly the hull. It's not like a big fat mama or, you know, like a big fat car with no reaction when you do something. You feel, you know, you, you, you do something, you feel it. The regatta takes place over six weeks in all. In each leg of the race circuit, the international lineup of teams spends about three days racing offshore before heading to their next port of call. There, the teams battle it out in city races, contests over short distances. It's exciting for both the spectators and participants. So you've got the best sailors in the world sailing the most exciting boats. So they're incredibly equal, so it's down to the, down to the sailors. Yeah. It's like uh, flying. When you steer the boat at 30, 35 knots. But the, 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 re the boat goes very fast, so you have to sink very fast, you have to take decisions very fast. The cabin is located in the middle hall. We are six persons when we are offshore and we have only two bunks, two places to sleep. <laughs> Follow me. All right, here we are. So you see, I can touch both sides of the hull. It's very, very, very narrow. Each crew member gets only four hours a day of rest on a rotation basis. Navigator is sleeping here. I show you here. So we are uh, in the middle of the boat here. The two, uh, the two bunks, the two sleeping bunks. After a long offshore leg from Dublin to Portugal, Sidney Gavinier is happy to be in Cascais with solid ground under his feet again. I really enjoy, I especially enjoy the, you know, the local small restaurant with the typical food, uh, local beer, local red wine, and it helps me to, to let go the pressure a little bit. And then it's time to set off for the start of the Kashkaish Harbor Race. Just getting a focus and for concentrate on what's the wind direction doing, wind speed doing, make sure that we all very focused on our jobs. Coming up to one minute. And they're off. 
Sidney Gavigné asks his crew to give their all. He makes sharp turns that take his opponents off guard and always manages to perfectly capture the wind. It's very uncomfortable, you know, but it's on the edge and uh, it's nice. The effort is worth it in the end. His team wins this leg of the race. After the awards ceremony, there's a gala celebration. Gavigné is proud that his crew have won the City Race Series here in Portugal. I hope it will keep uh, growing because it's more spectacular, we go quicker, we create a little bit of dream or, uh, you know, people in just in the morning connecting to internet to say, okay, where are they in the race now? That's just uh, enough to, to bring some positive vibration to some people. Now it's off again to the open seas. The Trimorans will reach their final port of call in Genoa, Italy next month. The world's leading imaging fair, Photokina, wraps up in Cologne this weekend. More than 1,200 exhibitors from 45 countries covered the entire spectrum of photo imaging, giving professionals and amateurs the chance to check out the latest trends and innovations. We're marking the occasion by looking into a unique photography technique that involves throwing the camera. Our report will explain more. These abstract light patterns look as if they've been created on a computer. In fact, they're photographs shot by Jens Ludwig. The technique he uses is called camera tossing. You can paint with motion and a bit of light. You paint pictures by moving the camera. Before he starts, Jens darkens the room. Then he chooses a colored light source as his subject. He presses the shutter release, then quickly throws the camera. The image is created while the camera is in flight. Chance plays a major role in this kind of photography. Jens doesn't have any specific tossing technique. Every toss is different, a bit farther to the left, or you turn more quickly. You can create similar pictures, but no two are exactly the same. Part of the art of camera tossing is finding new light sources. Jens loves to experiment, and he's known as Germany's best camera tosser. You can use different things as light sources. There are no limits to your creativity. You can just as easily take a candle and place one or more pieces of colored glass in front of it to get different lighting effects. Jens works in the IT industry. Photography is his hobby. He first encountered camera tossing in 2006. Since then, he's been on the lookout for subjects, as he is here where he lives in Radovzel on Lake Constance. The technique also works using daylight. When I toss the camera outdoors, the difference is that I don't really have one single light source. I have all the light of the sun, so completely different pictures result. I get a sort of blurring effect. But most of the time he works in the dark. Jens hurls his camera into the air up to 300 times to get a picture he's satisfied with. He corrects nothing in the pictures except brightness and contrast. There's a code of honor not to touch up the pictures and to really throw the camera. Not attach it to a cord or move it in the air with your hands. The camera really has to be tossed and be flying through the air without any help. Ryan Gallagher from the U.S. is considered the inventor of camera tossing. Purely by chance, he lobbed his camera into the air and was fascinated by the pictures that resulted. Camera tossers from all over the world post their photos on the Internet. These days, around 8,000 users are registered on the largest site. They evaluate and comment on each other's pictures. The feedback I got on my latest pictures was surprisingly very good. People seem to be fascinated by them. 
Jens estimates he's flung his digital camera into the air some 30,000 times, putting it at risk each time. High tosses are especially dodgy. Throwing around a camera that costs one or two hundred euros is pretty expensive. But other people have hobbies where they hit a ball with an expensive tennis racket. I toss my camera. Of course, something might break, but that hasn't happened to me yet. So long as Jens Ludwig keeps catching his camera, every toss will create a new and unique picture. The age-old British game of cricket has many rules and regulations when played in its traditional way. However, the match we're about to see is anything but traditional. The Isle of Wight Sailing Club annually play the Royal Southern Yacht Club from the mainland and their pitch is located somewhere between the two coastlines on a sandbank. This is the annual Brambles cricket match, taking place on the Brambles sandbank. But why here, since the playing field is so wet? It's just something different to do. It's uh, not, nothing else, no, nowhere else um, in the world can you do this. And you can only do this for a very few oh. minutes every year. It's a unique place. There are 11 players dressed in white on each team. There are no strict rules or even umpires. Some 300 onlookers have to stay in their boats because the sandbank is entirely underwater. So how are the playing conditions? Yeah, pretty good. There's a bit of sunshine, but the wicket's a little wet. A little wet today. Usually we have a lot more dry sand. Oh, God! A much bigger area. Last year, and the year before, the sandbank was more or less above water, so the match could go on without any problem. Bramble's Bank is three kilometres away from Cowes, a seaport town on the British Isle of Wight. Its island sailing club has existed since 1889. Rod Nichols has been a member for 54 years. The legend really is, we think the first matches that were played out there were played by prisoners from the local prison. There's three prisons on the Isle of Wight and the governor used to take the prisoners out there and play cricket and he thought it was quite a safe place for them because they couldn't escape from there. That's when it really, really started. But they only played sporadically. It was a local boat builder who turned the Brambles cricket match into a regular event go back to the mid-50s, that's when the cricket matches organised were started, and they were started by Uffa Fox. Uffa Fox is the famous uh, yacht designer and boat builder who lived in caves just a few metres away from where we're standing at the moment. And he started a, a cricket match between his team and their local hotel, Holmwood Hotel, along the, along the caves front. After Uffa Fox died in the early 1970s, the cricket matches stopped. But they were revived some ten years later by members of Hamble's Royal Yacht Club. Tom Richardson was one of them. We could get a team together and we then had to worry about who to play with. And we thought, well, as it's halfway between uh, North Island, which we call England, and the Isle of Wight, South Island, um, the uh, obvious team to play was uh, the Island Sailing Club. The Solent is the strait that separates the Isle of Wight from the British mainland. It's a busy shipping lane. And also the home waters of the Island Sailing Club, which stages the Brambles cricket match every two years, alternating with the Royal Yacht Club. About half an hour before the match starts, boats head out to the sandbank. The length of the game depends on the tide. Sometimes the cricketers get to play for up to 45 minutes, or, as in this year, only 25. Right, everyone, back to 
Jim Ribs, back to the Island Sailing Club. <laughs> At the end, it's a mad dash to get to the boats before the tide reaches them. It was, uh, it was a little wet, a little wetter than usual. The tide didn't go out quite as far as uh, the last year, but we had a good match. Uh, the Royal Southern fought valiantly, but we've beaten them. And uh, we're now on our way back to the clubhouse to uh, exchange the trophy. Traditionally, the trophy goes to the club that organised the game. Next year, they'll try again. Though exactly when and where will be determined by the tides. To finish the show today, we head to a rather unique butchers here in Berlin, where you can find all sorts of interesting meats. But you might want to think twice about eating them. Pork chops, bologna, sausages, dried serrano ham, and the finest Hungarian salami. This shop has them all, but they're cuddly, not edible. For her label Aufschnitt, which means cold cuts, designer Zylvia Weidt makes meats and sausages out of fabric. She has more than 40 different items in her collection. Walt, who studied garment making, opened her shop in Berlin in 2008. Meine Arbeit kann man sehr humorvoll verstehen. My work involves ironic humor. Because I'm a vegetarian, I don't have much to do with the meat industry. So I can have fun with products much more and present them aesthetically. Her creations aren't just decorative, they're functional as well. A curved sausage serves as a neck cushion, a string of smaller ones as a keychain. This sausage brooch costs just seven euros and 50 cents. The most expensive object in the shop is a bean bag, shaped like a giant ham for 320 euros. The 32-year-old designer gets inspiration at open air markets and the corner delicatessen. That's also where she gets ideas about how she'll later present her cuddly cuts of meat. I make the sausages according to certain criteria. The different elements have to be fairly large so I can reproduce them. A salami is hard to reproduce. But with a ham, which is marbled with fat, I can work with white and red fabric so it's recognizable. Sylvia says she would like her creations to sensitize people about meat, but in a light-hearted way. With my meat collection, I want to make people laugh. It's tongue-in-cheek. I'm not trying to prove a point or tell people they should eat more healthily or be more aware of what they eat. In her studio, a fashion designer helps Sylvia Weidt sew her products. A Berlin workshop for the disabled supplies some of the accessories. With larger orders, she works with a toy company in the Czech Republic. Every piece is handmade and unique. Her ham-shaped cushion is a hit. She sells about 300 pieces a year. The exact color and the right tactile feeling are important to the designer. The fabric for the ham, for example, has to be especially smooth and shiny. The idea came to me because of the name in German, Aufschnitt. It's a pun on tailoring and cuts of meat. I wanted to advertise my work, so I created a small sausage brooch. It was a runaway success and became the basis of the collection. Last year, the inedible ham and sausages were featured in a photo spread for a Berlin online magazine. The pictures were chosen to tell whimsical stories while making the best possible use of stereotypes. Sylvia Weidt's customers include both meat lovers and strict vegetarians. The unusual accessories are food for thought. I like the irony, although I do prefer the actual meat. <laughs> it's eye-catching. I don't know, I mean, I think about how, how does it feel to have something like this in your bed. 
Silvia Wald is already working on more ways for her customers to take cold meat to bed with them. Hearts, tripes and brains as shopping bags, caps and hot water bottles. All perfectly safe for use, even by hardcore vegetarians. And that's all we have time for today. Thanks for joining us, everyone, and hope to see you again very soon. For now, though, from all of us here, take care and goodbye. <laughs>